Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 13. We're going to continue on through this chapter, Acts chapter 13, um, where this, this was a challenging week uh, as, uh, as I took a look at, at this particular passage to preach through. Um, it's actually one story from verse 13 all the way through the end of verse 52. And I looked at that and went, oh, no. <laughs> That's going to be very difficult in order to try to work our way through in one Sunday, especially a communion Sunday. So I tried to break it in half um, and, and did the best I could. And we're going to fly in order to try to understand this chapter. Um, when I was probably, I think it was like a sophomore or junior in college, um, I went down to San Diego in order to spend some time um, uh, specifically with, with a family that I was getting to know. The, the, the parents were praying for me every day. They, they, they saw me preach and they really felt that God's hand was on me and they, they wanted to be a part of my ministry. And they continue to pray for me even to this day. Now, this family was part of a church that owned a thrift store. And during the day, I decided, um, or the, the, the mother that prayed for me said, hey, um, uh, my husband's going into work. You know, all the kids are in school. Um, do you want to come and, and hang out with me at our church's thrift store? And I said, sure. I mean, I don't, don't have any better, uh, anything better to do during the day. So we went to their church's thrift store in order to spend um, that time. Uh, while we were there, um, uh, lo and behold, towards the end of the day, we had a great conversation and people would come in and out and in and out and we would just talk and, and, and carry on our conversation. Well, while we were there at the end of the day, it turned out that two Mormon missionaries walked in and we sort of looked at each other and went, oh, this is going to be really interesting. Well, a divine appointment happened. Everybody else that was in the store happened to leave and now it was just the four of us. So... Um, my prayer mom, that's what I called her, she decided to start off the conversation. And she said, hey, uh, are you guys missionaries? And they kind of recognized the fact that now they're caught. And so they smiled and just sort of strolled over towards us and said, yeah, yeah, we are. And she said, wow, really? What is it that you believe? And so they proceeded to give us the traditional kind of Mormon spiel, right? Like we believe in, in Jesus Christ and that he ascended into heaven and then turned around and came back to the new world and blah, 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 right? They went through their, their whole little um, introduction to Mormonism 101, right? And while they finished, we kind of smiled and looked at each other and she said, really? Daniel, is that what you believe? And I said, no. And then they said, wow, what is it that you believe? You asked. So I proceeded to share with them the differences about what we believe. And then it became this sort of uh, amazing tag team where when I was speaking, my prayer mom was silently praying for me uh, as that, that what I said would get through to them as she would talk about stuff. I was silently praying for her and, and, and she was talking about things like the creeds. See, the Mormons believe that the church basically died right after the apostles and then went into apostasy all the way until Joseph Smith kind of revived the church through the Church of Mormon. Well, of course that's not true. And one of the reasons we know that's not true is because the church throughout history has made creeds clarifying what is it that we believe, like the Creed of Nicaea, the Creed of Constantinople, right? Uh, the Apostles' Creed, all outlining this is what the Bible teaches, this is what we believe. They had never even heard of a creed before. I happened to be studying church history at the time. I had a book of creeds in my backpack. So when they would tell, like, where are you even getting this information? Like the creed of Constantinople. I said, oh, let me show you. And I would go into my backpack and I pulled out these book of creeds and I was able to show them um, uh, where we're getting a lot of this information about what the early church believed. I also talked to them about consistency. See, I have had plenty of Mormon missionaries come to my house. In fact, when I was growing up, they decided to mark my home and they stopped coming to my house. Um, the reason was they got really worried about me and you know, a, high, a college student confusing their missionaries enough that, that they would go back to their deacons with all kinds of questions about what we would say in our conversation. 
So I've had a lot of conversation with them. And one of the things I know about them is their evangelistic passage in the, in the Book of Mormon called uh, the Book of Nephi. Um, and, and how they try to use that to evangelize people. And it's one of the passages that clearly talks about Jesus coming to the new world. Well, I mentioned some differences between what Nephi teaches that Jesus said and what, he, uh, what Jesus actually says in the Bible. And I know that they're supposed to believe both. But what happens if one book disagrees with the other book? At the very end of the conversation, I said this. Hey, um, I know that you guys believe the Bible and the Book of Mormon. But today you've realized that you cannot, that they contradict. So you have to choose which one are you going to believe. I am going to pick the Bible. Why? Because it's been tried, tested, and proven over time. What are you going to choose? I kid you not, I have never been so close to demonic intervention in my life. I saw one of those robust, young, healthy Mormon missionaries wither in front of us like a flower. And he became violently ill like he was going to throw up in the middle of the store. And he said, oh, I have to go. And the other missionary that was there was like, yeah, we, we do kind of need to go. And actually had to help his missionary partner out of the store. We looked at each other shocked. We've never seen something like that before, and I've never seen something like that ever since. Someone had a radical experience where God clearly spoke to them, and demonic forces were trying to hold on to them as much as possible and had to make them physically ill in order to get them out. Why? Because the gospel is powerful. When you preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, it does things. It might not do something right away. It might not do something in terms of the next five years. But God says my word will never return void. So if we understand what the gospel message is, you over time, I promise, are going to have those types of experiences when you are bold in declaring the gospel of Jesus. I know our church back in the Chi in, down in the Chinese congregation has been showing this video of this guy who's an Uber driver. And what does he do as an Uber driver? He decides to share the gospel with all the people who happen to purchase his services. He's a missionary as an Uber driver. I know you can do the same thing. Now, I know in some of your jobs, it gets a little bit touchy, like in terms of rules of your business and, and what you're allowed to discuss. And you don't want to turn people off or, or destroy the opportunity for people to be a customer. But I promise you, understand the gospel and transformative events are going to happen to you as you boldly declare it to the people around you. So what is the gospel and how do we share it? Well, remember some of what I've taught you earlier. You need to be able to be aware of where people stand and augment your gospel accordingly. Because if you're dealing with an atheist, I'm going to have a lot different conversation with an atheist than I would with someone who is very close to believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? I need to be adaptable. Today, we're going to look at how Paul presents the gospel to a group of people that are close to already believing in Jesus. Why? Because they're Jews. They're Jews in a synagogue who know what the Old Testament already says. And Paul is going to use that closeness to the gospel to give them some of the places in the Old Testament that clearly point to Jesus so that he can be able to hopefully seal the deal. Allow them to take that just last step of not only believing in God, the Father who loves them, but it believing in the Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose again for them so that they could have our sin forgiven. So today we're going to pick apart and analyze Paul's gospel message in Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 13. So Acts chapter 13, verse 13, we're going to read all the way through verse 41. Now, 
When Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in, uh, in uh, Pisidia, and on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. Now, after the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up, motioning with his hand and said, here is Paul's message. Men of Israel, you who fear God, listen. The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers and made people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with the uplifted arm, he led them out. And, about, and for about 40 years, he, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, the man from the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And he had, uh, and when he had found, or, or and when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, "I have found in David the son of Jesse a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised before his coming. John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel." And as John was fin had finished his course, he said, what, do you suppose that I am? I am not. Um, I am not he. No, but behold, after me, one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I'm not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the messenger of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their ruler, uh, rulers, <clears throat> Because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree, laid him in a tomb, and God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those whom he had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that God promised to the fathers. This has been fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second Psalm. You are my son, today I've begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, uh, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the Holy One, sure blessing of David, Two, there he also says in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. And he laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he who God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from, whom, from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said of the prophet should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astonished and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells you. What Paul does is important for us in order to understand how do you preach the gospel? How do you break new ground in a group of people who are already pretty close to receiving the Lord Jesus Christ? So let's understand what Paul does and how he does it in conjunction with this chapter. Now, it starts off in chapter 13 with, with Luke explaining where Paul goes. They have already gone all throughout Cyprus. They worked from uh, Salamis. They began to preach the gospel all the way through until they got to the other end of the island, which is Paphos. And on that other end of the island, they decided, hey, we've pretty much done our job. We have the leader of the island as a Christian. There's already a church that has been established here. Let's then go and break brand new ground someplace else. 
So they sailed from Cyprus up to what's now modern day Turkey to a city called Perga. And Perga is in the sort of province of Paphos. So they sailed there. Now, while they're sailing there, their compatriot, this is Barnabas's cousin, John, otherwise named Mark, decided, nope, I'm done. And so he returns after departing from them to Jerusalem. So he doesn't want to go back to Antioch. He doesn't want to stay in Cyprus, which is kind of where he was probably born and grew up. He decides to head to, his, uh, to the house in Jerusalem, where probably his mom is staying, uh, Mary. We learned about him when, uh, or learned about her rather, when we studied the um, Peter being possibly executed by Herod. He wants to go back there. Why? God only knows. So a lot of people have asked, why did John Mark bail? Why did he just decide he's with them on Cyprus? But as they continue the missionary journey, He's not? What happened? Ultimately, we have to be willing to say we just don't know. The Bible doesn't say why Mark decided to split, but he did. And we know later on, we're going to find this out, the reason why he splits ticks Paul off something awful. He is so angry with John Mark, he doesn't want to have anything to do with him. And I can kind of understand that. I have had people just kind of bail on me. And over the years, because I've preached for a long time, I mean, I've been preaching for more than 20 years as a pastor in various churches. I've had a lot of people decide after I've poured my life into them to just kind of up and leave. And sometimes people will, they, they go and I just say, you know what? Um, God be with you. God wants you someplace else. So may the Lord bless you. And, and we leave on great terms. And then there are other times where people do stuff and it just leaves a sour expression in my mouth. I just hate it. And so even though if they come, I will be nice. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking good riddance to bad rubbish. Right? I, I'm sorry. I'm a sinner too. Um, I don't like it when people for, for specific reasons bail on me. Now, we don't know, again, what those reasons are. We, we don't know if somehow he borrowed money maybe from Paul and never paid him back and was like, I got to get out of here. We don't know. There are some people that say maybe he got cold feet. Maybe he was just like, you know, we've been doing this for a while. I didn't know it was going to be this long. I'm done. Maybe, and I did hear a pastor I respected very much say it this way, and that is, beginning in Cyprus, it's Barnabas and Saul. But by the time you get to Acts 13, look at what Luke expresses. It's the ones around Paul did this. Barnabas, the one who was chosen as possibility, the replacement for Judas, now is taken second billing, and Paul is becoming more of the star. Maybe that didn't set well with John. Maybe he was like, wait a minute, why, why is Paul the one that's getting all the attention here? Why is he the one that's doing the most speaking? It's, it doesn't seem to be bothering Barnabas because he's going along with stuff just fine. His big um, uh, mission is not to be the one that's front and center, but to let Jesus be the one at front and center and encourage those who are doing the work of the Lord. And Paul's doing a great job. But maybe that's a problem to John Mark. Maybe he doesn't like Paul sort of getting too big for his britches. And so he splits. Again, we don't know why. That's just a theory. And he's gone. And that's going to radically change everything later on. The first missionary journey those continue, though continues. They stopped off at Perga and they end up going north to another city called Antioch. This Antioch city is in Galatia in a small province called Pisidian. And so they're preaching there. When they arrive, they decided to go to the best place to start ministry, just like they were doing in Cyprus. They went to the synagogues. 
And in the synagogues, they already had Jews that already know the Old Testament. So they felt it's an easier way to begin the work of preaching and teaching the gospel. So they get to the synagogue and they were just going to sit down and watch. This is really good advice whenever you're starting a new ministry. When I first got here, now it's like been almost five years. In fact, no, today is September, right? Today marks year five for me preaching and teaching here at GCCI. That's exciting. Okay. Been here five years. Now, when I first got here, my job was not like, ha, 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 learn from me. That, that would not be good. Right? I needed to know the church culture. I needed to know how things work. So I didn't put myself out there a lot. I, even though um, I'm a known speaker in many churches across Southern California, I just waited to observe how this church worked and tried to fit in as best as I could. And because I preached and teached and consistently taught the word of the Lord, um, opportunities for, for greater service continued to happen here at GCCI, and God is continuing to do a wonderful work. We've added male, uh, male marriage counseling. We've added father's school. We've, we've taken the youth group into, make, into talking about equipping classes. Lots and lots of good stuff. But you got to start with observing a little bit. That's what Paul and Barnabas intended. We'll sit down. We'll watch. We'll begin to figure things out. But as they sat down, the leader of the synagogue... Um, just finished doing their daily reading because they had sort of a, a, a liturgy where they would pick from the scrolls that they had, they would pick portions of the Old Testament prophets, portions of the law in order to read each and every Saturday because that's when the synagogues met, not on Sunday, but on Saturday. So each and every Saturday, they would read portions of the Old Testament. Now, they just finished the reading, and usually someone would be pre-selected in order to give a message, often based upon what was read. But this leader of the synagogue, this teacher, looked at two newcomers, and he must have kind of recognized them a little bit, probably because of their dress um, uh, most definitely they didn't talk exactly the same way that they're used to. And so he turns to them and he says, hey, do you guys have an exhortation from us, for us? If you do, you have to speak. This is that divine appo appointment. This is where, like those Mormon missionaries with me said, well, what is it that you believed? Well, they asked, and so did the leader of the synagogue. So, so everybody kind of begins to buzz. What is it, two new people here? What's going on? And they're asked to speak. Does he know them? What? You, you can just feel the ripple being spread across the men in the synagogue that day. So Paul stands up and with his hand, he, he motions to them probably to just get them to calm down a little bit, to quiet down. And he's going to begin to speak. And as he speaks... This is where he begins. He starts Old Testament. He starts with Abraham and the patriarchs, Genesis. And he begins to explain what happened, that God took Israel and even allowed them to prosper in the land of Egypt and with his outstretched arm led them out. So he just covered in a couple sentences, Genesis and Exodus, okay? Now he goes on. He's going to talk a little bit about numbers. And he says, and God endured with them in the wilderness for 40 years. Okay. Now they're all familiar with these stories. They might have even read a little bit from those stories um, in some of the scrolls that they had in the synagogue that day. So he's doing his best to tie the Old Testament into what he wants to say. But he continues to explain kind of like the big picture class, what we'll do with the youth. He does it in just one message. And he says, and he gave them inheritance after taking down seven nations in the land of Canaan. That's the entire book of Joshua. And then he says, and, and from then, he, after, uh, as to 450 years uh, with Israel, he gave them judges until the day of Samuel. So he just now did all of Joshua, now judges, Ruth, and now we have 1 Samuel, right? And he talks a little bit more in length about 1 Samuel. He says the people there didn't want judges anymore. They asked for a king and God gave them um, Saul, 
uh, from Benjamin in the tribe, um, uh, uh, or from the tribe of Benjamin, Saul, the son of Kish. And then, and this is the important part, he's going to stop right here. He says, after removing Saul, again, this is all in, in uh, 1 Samuel, after removing Saul, he raised up David unto them to be king because he said, this is important, I found David according to my heart who will do all my will. David becomes or is a man after God's heart and, and God knows David is going to perform the will of God. And Paul intentionally wants to stop with David. He doesn't talk about the Davidic kingdom. He doesn't talk about Solomon. He doesn't talk about the split, the divided kingdom under Rehoboam and Jeroboam the first. He doesn't talk about any of that history he doesn't include the temple. He doesn't include the exile. He does not include the return. He just wants to get to David. What in the world is Paul doing here? What Paul is doing is important for us in any gospel event. Paul is trying to use a principle in persuasion that's identified by Kenneth Burke as identification. Sam Gundikutz calls it joining the in-group. What do we mean by that? If I just walk up to you and I try to persuade you of anything, the very first thing you're going to ask yourself is, why should I believe you? And if I appear, as Sam Gundikutz would say, if I appear to be an outsider where I don't know anything about you, I'm just trying to tell you this is what you should do with your life. You're going to look at me and say, rightfully so, well, who the heck are you? Why should I listen to you? What gives you the right, the knowledge, the expertise to inform anything about my life? It, it, it would be almost like if, if you were kind of maybe had a bad day in your marriage and you're just like, you know, I, I'm, I'm really been struggling for a while. And someone came up to you, well, you know what you should do with your marriage? You'd be like, who are you? Right? Why, why, why are you telling me what to do? Dude, fix your own life before you fix mine. Right? That... Is, is what you don't want to do. What you should do is make sure that the person that you're talking to feels like you are one of them. If you are an outsider, you need to become an insider. You need to make them feel comfortable with you so that you're not from the outside going, you should do this, this, and this. And they're like, what? Right, you're from the inside going, maybe we should do this and this. And they're like, oh, yeah, I should think about that. That, that. that sounds good. So Paul spends the very first part of his message building that identification so that they feel that Paul is just like them. He's a Jew. He's a good Jew. He knows his Old Testament. He knows all the key parts of the, the beauty that God had chosen us out of, out of all the nations of the world through Abraham, raised us up even while we were in Egypt, brought us into the promised land, destroyed our enemies, and gave us a king and a kingdom and the greatest king of all time, King David. And so it's making them feel good that Paul is identifying to them. We should do the same thing, especially when we're dealing again with a group that is close to the faith. The Jews are really close to the faith. They believe the Old Testament. They already know about their sin. So he doesn't have to do the whole CEF way of let's talk about how God loves you and then let's talk about sin, right? They've already got step one and two down. He needs to get to Jesus. So he wants to say, hey, I know the Old Testament. Let me give you an overview. Now we can get to the really good part about what the Old Testament points to. Make sense? So we need to take this kind of tactic when someone is so close to the faith already. Who could be so close? Possibly someone like an Orthodox or practicing Jew. Uh, there are lots of Jews that, man, when, when, when you talk to them, they they sound a whole lot like a Christian because they're really practicing the Old Testament and trying to do what it says. Very, uh, a very prominent example of this is a man by the name of Dennis Prager. Dennis Prager says, I think I am the most prayed for man in the United States. And, and, and you might ask why, I don't even know who Dennis Prager is. Dennis Prager is a radio host, he's a conservative, he's on the Salem Radio Network, 
Um, and he is a practicing Jew. He's written some great books called the Rational Bible, explaining the Old Testament and why God would do things from a very intellectual, rational way. He's an excellent, excellent speaker, uh, a wonderful man. And often people on his radio who have called in who are Christians have said, Dennis, you're like, you're like an evangelical Jew. And he smiles and says, yes, that's, a, that's exactly what I'm like. Because he really does believe and follow the Bible. And the reason why he's prayed for so much is because that good Christians love him and want him to go all the way into the kingdom by putting his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he doesn't believe that the New Testament is inspired by God, which is why he still clings only to the Old Testament. But he's so close. That's the type of person especially um, uh, if they're really trying to obey what God says, where you can use the kind of tactics that we're going to see Paul use onto an Orthodox or practicing Jew. Another person that you might use this on is a nominal Catholic. What do I mean by that? Often Catholics will have been baptized into the Catholic Church. They'll have been raised up as a Catholic. They may have even gone through confirmation as a Catholic. But now in their life, they're kind of following their own way. They're not really attending church. They might, you know, kind of go to church with their family uh, during Easter and Christmas, you know, the big holidays, right? But they're not really practicing their faith on a week by week basis. They're mostly just living an average life. If they especially grew up in a parish where they did not teach what you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, which unfortunately there are many priests who don't, then because they've already been taught the Old Testament, because they've already been taught a little bit of the New Testament, um, but they don't really know their Bible, you can use this to show them the supremacy of Christ and what does it mean to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Another group that this might work on is Mormons. Why? Because like I said at the beginning of this message, Mormons do say they believe the Bible. And when you show them what the Bible says, it often might convince them of the Bible's superiority. Because they say they believe the Bible, but they study the Book of Mormon. They know the Book of Mormon inside and out. They don't know really what the Bible says. So explain to them how the Bible so perfectly fits together in order to give us what the gospel is. These tactics might work, but only when someone is close. You can't do this type of unidentification as an, on an atheist, Right? If I wanted to go and talk about how the Lord chose the people of Israel, they're going to first say to me, well, how do I believe? Why should I even believe in a God? Right? It, this type of, of, of evangelism doesn't work on everyone. So we must be willing to customize our message to our audience. That's what Paul starts out with. This is a specific message for believing Jews. And now he gets to the crux. The crux is this. God, through David, brought a savior, namely Jesus, from this seed according to the promise that he gave to Israel. So he's already set up, this savior has come, God brought him, and it's exactly according to the promise that God has made. And then he introduces John. John, who probably they heard a little bit about, because some big event as John and the beheading of John would have sent ripples all throughout the diaspora all throughout the Jewish communities that were all over the world. So he mentions John. He mentions his baptism unto the repentance of sin, that John is supposed to point the way. And John himself said, you think I'm the Messiah? No, 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 no. There's someone who's coming after me who I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. So John knows he's not the one. Who is the one? It is the one John was pointing to, Jesus. What is Paul doing here? He's taking what they know, the Old Testament, and introducing what they need to know as a bridge, the New Testament. What then does he explain next? The, his thesis is this. The word of this salvation was sent forth to us. That's what I want you to know, how to be saved. And he quickly explains it. What does he explain? He explains that the Jews didn't understand very prophets that they were reading every week. 
in the synagogues. What they just got through reading, that these prophets are pointing to Jesus. And they took Jesus and, and they fulfilled the prophets, the very things that they were reading, but they didn't understand what they were reading. So they were fulfilling those by taking Jesus and even though they didn't find anything wrong with him, going to Pilate and saying, crucify him. And Pilate does. After Jesus fulfilled everything that he needed to fulfill on the law, he was buried so we know he really died and Jesus rose again. God raised him from the dead. And Jesus didn't just rise from the dead, but he was saw and was for many days witnessed alive by the people who followed him from Galilee to Jerusalem, by the apostles, um, uh, by Peter, James, and John, those who were his disciples, and by others who are now gathering as, as members of this church. They saw Jesus come back to life. What then is the essence of salvation that Paul has has given? This, if you can write anything down, if you want to take any notes on this message, this is what I would encourage you to take. This is what you need to be willing to say to anyone who says, I think I might want to believe in Jesus. You need to make sure that Jesus died a sinless death. You need to make sure you say that he indeed was dead because he was buried. And here's the crux of it. You need to talk about how People witnessed his resurrection from the dead, which is specifically a fulfillment of God's promise. Why does all of that matter? Jesus' death is what pays for our sin. On the cross, Jesus is separated from God. It became dark around him for three hours. Our sin was being placed upon his body. So his death is critical to talk about the payment of sin. But it's his burial and resurrection that Paul finds the most important. And the reason why it's the most important is because it proves who Jesus is. So please, 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 please. If you mention that Jesus died for sin, bring him back to life. Do not just talk about his death. His death is important. It is so important. By that, our sin is paid. But death is not important if we don't have the resurrection. It separates us from every other religion that's out there. Every religion has his, the major uh, leader die. Buddha died. Joseph Smith, founder of the Mormon church, died. Muhammad died. They all died. Everybody died. I'm going to die. You're going to die. Everybody's going to die. Death is not that big of a deal. But the resurrection is. We can go to the tomb of, of where Muhammad was buried. He was, was um, it's a very sacred place in the Islamic community. They've made a whole shrine of it. We can go to that place. And if we dug him up, we could see his bones. We could go to the grave of Joseph or to the grave of Joseph Smith. And it says, here lies Joseph Smith. We can go to Buddha's grave. Now, some say he has many graves, like his arms buried over here, his head over there, his body over there. He's supposedly buried all over um, Asia. But there is actually, you can do some research and notice that there is a monastery, I think in, to, in Tibet, that claims to have the actual bones of Buddha. He's dead. They all die. But we can go to Jesus' grave. But what's the difference? It's empty. So by this, we are unique. We don't worship a leader who died. We worship and have a relationship with a leader who's still alive. That very fact, Paul says means that what we believe matters. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says multiple times, if Christ isn't raised from the dead, our faith is in vain. 
the resurrection of Jesus that was witnessed by the apostles separates us and makes us know that our sin can be forgiven. And it is that resurrection that Paul is going to go to again and again and again as he talks to this synagogue about the gospel. He goes on and says, and we are here to evangelize you. We are here to tell you about the promise that was given to our fathers. What is that promise? Here's the proof. And this, if, if, if you can watch this multiple times, or take pictures of some of these slides, this is where the Old Testament proves the New Testament, or at least points to the New Testament. Why? Look at this. God fulfilled to his children what he wrote about in the second Psalm, in Psalm 2, verse 7. He says, because of the resurrection, you are my son. Today, I have begotten you. Today, God took a person who looked just like you and me and upon his resurrection gave him something that nobody else had. Jesus' resurrected body is beyond belief. It's not just like my flesh and bone, though it does contain flesh and bone. He can appear and disappear. He can ascend into heaven. He can do all kinds of miracles because of the power and glory that now rests visibly upon him, not just because he is a person and God, God, but because he is the first fruit of all those who have died. He now has a resurrected body and we will have the same body that he has one day. God says, I have begotten you. You are clearly my child. You are divine through the, through the resurrection. So because he now mentions the resurrection a second time, he first an explanation of the gospel, now in showing how the Old Testament points to it, shows that this resurrection equals divinity. The resurrection proves Jesus is not just a person, he's God. Then he says, but, and again he mentions the resurrection, but that he raised him out of death in order to no longer return to decay. This is a key argument, and we've heard this argument before. This argument was given by Stephen when he gives the defense of the gospel. Paul has heard this argument and he likes it. So he's going to use it himself. And he says, hey, we're, this body is no longer going to return to decay. The third time he mentions the resurrection is now talking about how the resurrection fulfills God's promise. What promise is that? First part of the promise. This is in Isaiah 55, 3. He says, God says this. I gave to you the holy faithful one of David. What is this passage saying? That David was given a promise by God that he would be the progenitor of the Messiah. So that God is saying, I'm fulfilling my promise that I made to David by giving you Jesus, right? So David leads to the Messiah of Jesus. He's connecting Jesus to that Davidic line. Then this is the important part of the argument. But also... David says in Psalm 1610, you will not give your holy one to see decay. You will not give your holy one to see decay. Namely, that this holy one that David is talking about, that David is saying, God, I know what you're going to do with him. This holy one is not going to be dead long enough to have his body rot away. Something is going to happen. Well, what? What's going to happen? Right? God is not going to let his Holy One remain dead. What is he going to do? Well, Paul tells us this can't be David. Why? Because he says in verse 36, David slept after he served Israel for a number of years. David slept um, uh, by means of, of following the counsel of God and was added to his father and saw decay. So David's not talking about himself. Who then is he talking about? This is the resurrection of Jesus. The fourth time he mentions it. That the resurrection is showing that Jesus is God's Messiah. The resurrection, then if you put all of it together, means these things to Paul. And this is why the resurrection matters so much. The resurrection proves Jesus is divine. The resurrection is a fulfillment of prophecy that he is of the line of David and that he will not see decay. And the resurrection demonstrates that Jesus is this promised Davidic Messiah. 
which points to one undelible truth. If Jesus rose from the dead and he is the Messiah, then that means it leads to the forgiveness of sins. The resurrection shows that we can be forgiven. And Paul says this directly. He says, so now because we know Jesus is the Messiah, all can be forgiven and justified. And he adds this at the end of this verse, even the stuff that you can't justify under the law of Moses, God allows us to have all sins, everything justified, everything forgiven. Everything can be made clean because of the act of Jesus Christ. He allows all of us to be forgiven. This is the end of the gospel. It's the first time he ever talks about sin. Why? Because he knows that they already know about sin. He doesn't need to beat a dead horse. He just needs to say, I know you're trying to obey the law. I know you're trying to be a good person. I know you're trying to follow what is right. But the law of Moses cannot justify you. Just doing as much good work as you can do today cannot save you. Why? Because it doesn't fix the sin that is already in you. Imagine, church, if I lived a perfect life from this point on, I did everything right. I never did a single sin. What would happen? One, it would kill my wife. She would be so shocked. But the second thing that would happen is you guys would be like, wow, Pastor Daniel, you are super holy, right? But if I didn't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I would still be condemned to hell. And the reason is doing all that good doesn't take care of the sin I had already committed. It only gave God what he was already due. My obedience. But it doesn't fix the problem that I need addressed. My sin to be forgiven and for me to be justified. For God to take a guilty sinner like me and say, not guilty. But he says, all, for those of faith, all can be forgiven. All can be justified. How? He says, but you have limited time. He says, you don't know what's going to happen to you. And you don't want to have the prophet that he's going to talk about in just a second, what his words have happened to you. He says this. Habakkuk 1.5, he quotes, you must behold, namely those who despair, namely those who are marveling, you must be destroyed. Wait, what? Oh, hold on. What's going on? What's happening in Habakkuk? Habakkuk has gone to God and said, God, you are holy. You are righteous. You are good. But the children of Israel are sinful. When are you going to be God and punish them for their sin? And God says, I will. I will. I'm raising a Babylon to do it. I will punish them for their sin. God will judge sin. He is just. He does punish sin. And if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul is saying, then you're going to have this happen. There's going to be a work that God is going to do, a work you can't even believe. You won't even believe it as we're describing it to you. But if you don't believe it, it will pass you by and you will fall under the destruction watching from the sideline that amazing work of God happen. And it's happening right now. Every one of us has a choice, a choice here today to believe and receive this gospel for ourselves or to let it go and to just go about our job, our business, our lives as if God doesn't exist. But if you do, these words of Habakkuk may be fulfilled in you. That you watch the work that God is doing here at GCCI. You watch the work that God is doing all around the world. And you allow that great work to pass you by. And if it does, you will be the one who is destroyed. You will be the one who marveled at what God did. And you will live an eternity in despair. So Paul ends by quoting Habakkuk with a challenge to this synagogue. What is it that you want to do? And if you want to find out their response, you got to come back next week. So how then do you evangelize those who seem so close to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? 
you do so this way. One, you begin by identifying with them. Make them understand you are part of them. You are not an outsider pointing your finger at them. You're an insider saying, hey, come and join me. This is good. Number two, you clearly explain the keys of the gospel. That this sinless Jesus died for sin, that he was buried, proving that he really did die, and that he rose again so that all can be forgiven. And then third, you show that the resurrection is so important because it is pointed to in the Old Testament. David writes in the psalm himself, God, you're not going to allow your Holy One to see corruption. And that was done. That was fulfilled by Jesus rising from the dead on the third day. His body never experienced corruption. He rose. He was witnessed by the apostles, by the people of the early church. And then he ascended into heaven, proving that truly he is divine and the only one who can forgive sins. And you give him a challenge that they can have their sin forgiven if they only believe in this Jesus. If they don't, then they will await eternal destruction. The choice always has to be theirs. So church, now again, you have heard the gospel. It is not exactly the same as what you have heard it before, but... It is true. So you too, if you understand it, can teach it so that other people can be saved. The name of our church is GCCI, GCCI, Great Commission Church International. Since the beginning of Acts, we have seen how Jesus has called us to preach the gospel in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. Church, You know how to do it. The challenge is yours. Will you let this gospel go to where God is calling you to go? Or will it lie dormant on your mouth? Letting other people just witness the work of God from the sidelines and only lead to their own destruction. Let us pray. First, I have to ask, are there people here who have not yet received Christ as their savior? You know the gospel. You have have heard it again today. You have sinned and that your sin separates you from God. But Jesus came to die for your sin and to come back to life so that you could live. And because of that, you now can believe on him and be saved. Is there someone here who says, Pastor, I've never done that. I want to believe in Jesus. I want to be saved for the first time. Then if that is you right now, where you are in this auditorium, you can raise your hand. It's only for those who have not yet believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and want to for the first time. Is that you? Then just raise your hand and I'll lead you in a prayer. If you happen to be watching online, And you now have heard the gospel too. You you might have not even known about any of this, but you now do know that your sin has separated you from God, but that you can believe in Jesus' death and resurrection in order to have your sin forgiven. Then if that's you, please indicate something by typing in our chat that you want to receive Christ as your savior. And if that's the case, then I'm gonna say a prayer and I'm gonna let you pray this prayer right after me. You can say these words in your heart to God, wherever you're at. You can say these words, dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I've done things that separates me from you. But I also believe that you came You lived a sinless life and that you died on a cross for my sin. You were buried and you came back to life after three days. And because you did that, 
I can have my sin forgiven. And all you ask is that I believe in you. So Jesus, I put my faith in you. I receive you as my savior. Thank you for what you did for me. If you did that, please come and talk to me. Let me know. Let me rejoice with you over what you did. Knowing that you now are a child of God and will forever be with me in heaven, you will receive that new body that Jesus had upon his resurrection. But today you also know the gospel. You've been taught not just what it is, but you're taught what you can say in order to help let people believe in Jesus. You're given a gift. And when much is given, much is required. Are you going to let that gift remain dormant upon your lips so that people in your family, so that people who are your friends will never hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or will you be bold like Paul? Will you be willing to break new ground in your family's life and in your friend's life? Will you be willing to say what you have learned today to explain to them what the gospel is so that they might be given the challenge to receive the Lord Jesus and be saved. Will you go as God is calling you today to go? If you will, pray this prayer right now. Lord Jesus, take all of me. Use me to spread your word. Use me to let your gospel advance. Let me not be ashamed. Let me not be afraid of what the enemy might do. Use me to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen.